This is Shop Culture. I'm Courtney Kaysen, and this is a podcast dedicated to the exploration of the obsession and celebration of all things shopping. This week on Shop Culture, we will be hanging out with Cameron Silver. He is the owner of the L.A.-based Decades Vintage Consignment Shop. He's also the creative director of H. by Halston, and as a lot of you know, an incredible style guru. Hi, Cameron Silver. Hello, Courtney. How your, are you? Your hair is particularly dapper today. You know, I gave myself a blowout and I used a flat iron. You are so impressive. No, I'm just very resourceful. You are? <laughs> All right. So I want to know the last thing that you purchased. Um, I almost bought a shower curtain today, but that's not very sexy. <laughs> Now, what made you want to buy a shower curtain? Like, I, is yours at home old, multi? I thought the one in New York needed a refresher, but I just washed it. It's fine. I mean, it's uh, – but I thought like <laughs> – but I wasn't sure, like, do people have two shower curtains and you rotate them? Like, I don't know what the protocol is with shower curtains. So I spent a lot of time looking at different websites to buy a shower curtain. And, mm-hmm. of course, I'm the weird person who when they say um, – you have the sort of prompts like high to low, low to high, like high yeah. to low. So I want to see the most expensive sure. shower sure. curtain. Sure. Do you think that there's a bougie shower curtain out there? Were you surprised? Oh, I, I were you saw, shocked? I saw shower curtains that were so expensive, but I really wanted to replicate the last shower curtain I got, which is made by a French company that no longer wholesales in America. So what's your shower curtain style? Very simple, like a piquet shower uh-huh. curtain that is water repellent because I don't want to do a shower liner. I don't need two things. I want one thing to do its job. But QVC actually has a nice shower curtain that I thought about buying, but I didn't buy it. So, sure. So back to your real question, what was the last thing I bought? It was when I was in Nashville, I went to Manuel, the famous tailor of Western wear. And I bought a Western shirt. And Manuel happened to be there. Did you go to Manuel when you were in Nashville? I just, I can't even believe you right now. Go on. Tell me more. So Manuel happens to be there. And I go in there and I, and I say, hi, you know, I've got some original vintage Manuel pieces that you, that you did. And I have some pieces when he worked with Nudie. Like yeah. The, so, he, he, so he was so entranced. Uh, but, but then I only bought like a, like the, the stuff is expensive. So I, sure. bought, I bought a Western shirt that arrived today. Okay, so what's your Western style? Like, do you have, like, that very cool, like, simplistic tie to go with it? I I don't wear a bolo tie. A bolo tie. That's the specific one. Go on. But I do like a good Western shirt. I mean, I'm a little bit country. Sure. Did you find yourself saying y'all while you were down there? Oh, y'all, y'all, y'all. Like, constantly. I gave my entire speech in sort of weird conjunctive adverbs and adjectives and nouns all mixed together into one unpronounceable word that would probably make my English advanced AP English teacher furious. But <laughs> I, I, when I was there, I, it, there's something about being in Nashville, where which is so like, it's so happening. It's, mm-hmm. it's really kind of exciting to be there because there's so much building and construction and, and, and arts and wealth and, and, mu- and um, money and, and money and money because there's so much <laughs> money there. And, and the music going on, I just I had to get the Western shirt. Then I also bought from a sort of more under-the-radar designer called Old Iron, I think is what they're called. Okay. A pair of sort of like stage pants with um, sequin, <laughs> a lightning bolt going down the side. Amazing. So, I, so are you planning to get on stage anytime soon? Well, I basically bought, like, I'm the cliche guy who goes to Nashville. I also bought a Stetson. Yes, you did. So I bought a Stetson that looks like a big Amish hat. Perfect. And the rim is so wide that I had to wear it on the airplane. And it was really <laughs> a problem, like, getting on the airplane. So, the, so, you know, it's like, oh, my God, I'm the total cliche. Like, the, the, the Beverly Hills kid who goes to Nashville buys a Stetson, a, a Manuel shirt, and, like, stage pants. That's amazing. Now, usually hats, they go by, like, gallon sizes, right? This hat is really big. I mean, it's – it's and it's not like your typical cowboy hat. It, sure. I mean, it's still a Stetson, but – um, it was made for the hotel I stayed at, the Noel Hotel. Did you visit? I've seen it. Yeah, it's a I've great seen hotel. It, yeah. so, so it was made for the – it's exclusive to the Noel. Always a selling point for me. This is only available here at the Noel. Sure. <laughs> but it, it's – I thought, so I actually wore um, – one night I went to dinner and I wore the Stetson hat with the new 
pants with mm-hmm. the lightning bolt. And I th- felt like in the restaurant, everyone was like, who's this poser? <laughs> well, okay. So th- that's interesting that you say that. So you think after all of these purchases, people did not believe you were a living amongst us cowboy living his best life in Nashville. No, I think they probably thought I was the dude from the West Coast who sort of drank the Kool-Aid. Trying to make it work. Yes, but I but I love the pants. And I actually sent pictures of the pants to a friend of mine who's obsessed with Gucci. Yeah. I was like, look at these Gucci pants I found in Nashville. <laughs> and then I explained, no, they're, they're a local designer. Well, so when you go shopping, because, I mean, let's talk about you growing up in Beverly Hills. Do you feel like you know how to shop, like it's in your genetics because you grew up in Beverly Hills? Oh, I think I, I have a genetic predisposition to consume. Not necessarily because I grew up in Beverly Hills. It's because my parents love to shop. My parents love to travel. And as an only child, I would join them on all of these trips. And uh, one which I remember so vividly was I was three and a half and we went to South America. And I can remember being in Peru and Venezuela and Buenos Aires. and, And so much of the discovery of these cities were by purchasing things that were artisanal. Yeah. I, I bought a a pom. It was he was called pom pom bomb bomb. He was a wait puppet. one more time pom pom bomb bomb pom pom bomb bomb, and pom pom bomb bomb was like a llama puppet. I I really remember it. But then my mom once put it in the washing machine, and pom pom bomb bomb died. I want to just tell you this random fact about myself. So my husband's middle name is Pomeroy. I'm going to have to name my children Pomeroy. Do you have a Pomeranian? I should have a Pomeranian. But there's like that old school cartoon where he's like, oh, hey, Pom Pom. So I actually call my husband AG. I'm like, oh, hey, Pom Pom. But now I want to be like Pom Pom Bomb Bomb. You should call him Pom Pom Bomb Bomb. And, but I'm still looking for Pom Pom Bomb Bomb. Like I need to go back to Peru and to the catacombs and find Pom Pom Bomb Bomb. It, it, it has such like, but it, but it's amazing that the the shopping and the things that we purchased, and, and my parents are not excessive. I don't want yeah. to kind of like give this idea that oh, like we we just shop and shop. But I really it helps me remember those trips. So the you think I by per- okay, so you feel like those memories are still intact because of the purchases you made years ago. Yes, and the temper tantrum I had in Buenos Aires when I wanted McDonald's, and my mother said, "Yeah, this is like 1972." My mom's like. There is no McDonald's in Buenos Aires. You will eat what you were fed. And like, I didn't even eat a lot of McDonald's as a little kid. We weren't even allowed to have white bread or anything. Like my parents were so strict. So I don't know where the McDonald's thing came from. Oh, that's amazing. Well, our friend, Lori Goldstein, who you know really well, mm-hmm. chatted with me one time about the fact that her one of her first jobs was at Fred Siegel. You know, Anyone in fashion probably did some time at Fred Siegel. I did it when I was 14. So do you make any money at Fred Siegel? Because I look at that as a consumer of that store, and I go in, and I I can feel my heart pitter-pattering because I'm going to make a decision, usually siding with Fred Siegel, that I'm going to forego a bill this month so that I can have shoes, I can have jeans. How do you make money working and living at Fred Siegel? Well, I think the gig cost my parents money. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and, and they would always hire kids from Beverly Hills High School to work during the sale. So we all thought this is so much fun. And uh, we would hide the things we really wanted until they went like 95% off. And, sure. And this is the 80s where things were not astronomical. I mean, you could actually get something designer and nice for 30 or $40, 90% off. So what would you tell your parents when you overspent on maybe your allotted budget? Like, how did you justify those pieces from C- Fred Siegel working there, buying them, and then still coming up short with your parents? That's a good question. My parents were very tolerant. I was a good kid. Like straight A's? I mean, not straight A's, but I, I mean, good enough that I that I got into UCLA. Yeah. And I was like president of Madrigals, president of Shield Honor Society, a spirit commissioner. I mean, all of these things. So I think I was a good kid that my parents were, were indulgent in a non-spoiled way. And I didn't really take that much advantage, except when we would... Um, like when I was 13, I was obsessed with polo shirts. And my mom said that we could not leave like Saks of Avenue without buying me a polo shirt. In every single color? I had them all. And then my mom said like a year later, I gave them all to the housekeeper. <laughs> <'Cause> I, <laughs> because I had become punk. I had been preppy and then I went punk. So you have gone from head of the spirit committee wearing these beautiful like polos 
were they, I mean, what brand were they? Were they like I Ralph Lauren? Like a Ralph like, Lauren like, yeah, yeah, a Ralph Polo shirt. And, sure. and I kind of wish I still had them because they're, like, they're so classic. Did you pop your collar? Oh, yeah. I would pop it. I would starch it. I sure. think I would double polo collar. But you, <gasps> Amazing. Oh, yeah. Like, seriously, every cliche. I'm obsessed with clothes and obsessed with style, especially like I think so much of getting to discover who 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 you are is yeah. sort of how – we dress ourselves. So do you feel like when you find something that is your jam, you should have it in every color? Yes, but I'm as I approach 50, I am not consuming in the same way. And and actually my the last 3 years of being on QVC has made me into a better consumer. Okay, so how's all right, so Let's talk about this. Like, how do we even name this? There's like before. Okay, so before QVC, oh, yeah. how did Cameron it's BQ Silver and you know? It's yeah, B- AQ. Yes, BQ, 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 and AQ. AQ. All right, so BQCS versus AQCS. What's what gives? So I think that prior to QVC, I was so obsessed with like high end designer editorial clothing. I wore the most over the top pieces. I was a, a real like New York and European Fashion Week fixture. I all I cared about is like how many times I would end up in women's wear daily. How many times have you ended up in women's a, wear a daily? A lot, a lot. I you mean, don't like, have a finite number. No, no, but like a lot. Like you know, or having Bill Cunningham photograph me for New York Times, or you know, being on Style dot com when it existed. I was very, very conscious of that kind of branding of myself as a as a fashion personality. And do you feel like those purchases? created that brand? I think they did, but it cost a lot of money to get to that place. Then as I, you know, entered into this QVC world, I kind of saw like, wow, these clothes are really expensive I've been buying. QVC, like there's, there really is quality and value here. You're so such a great cheerleader for I, our brand. I, I really am. It, so it made you're me- tall, you're handsome, you have an amazing voice. I mean, nobody cheers on QVC better than Karen Silver. <laughs> well, thank you. So I think it, it made me sort of rethink how I shop. And, and certainly, I don't wear those same things anymore on air. I mean, I wear a suit with a white collar shirt on sure. air. I'm not going to wear like crazy McQueen things. But with crazy McQueen things and beautiful vintage pieces, which you've collected over the years, do you think the money was worth it to get you where you are today? I think that it was the journey that got me to where I am. And and I think so much of the way I expressed myself was through clothes. And and it enabled me to do these incredible things. I don't think I would be where I am today had I not spent all my money on clothes. (laughs) But had I not spent all my money on clothes, I might have had a house in Malibu. So, <laughs> but the house Cameron, in Malibu. Cameron, what kind of house? Like a like, four bedroom, five like bath, not, pool? Not as big as shares, but. Uh, so something modest, like three bed, two bath. Maybe two. Uh, maybe No, I probably could have had three bedroom, three bath. Would you see the ocean? Yes, I think okay. I because had I started had I like can done someone it, pull up Zillow right now so we can get a but fine I, night number? But I would have had to purchase the house like by two thousand two or two thousand four. Sure. Like but, I, it, it would, and I think that. Um, but had I had the house in Malibu, would I be on QVC today? Maybe not. So. <laughs> All of those suits and the shoes and the jewelry and and um, the the bags and all the accoutrement got me to QVC. So this raises some interesting thoughts that I'm having in my head right now because we live in a world where there are more influencers than ever. I mean, you go on Instagram and it's like tap, you shop the look, things are delivered to your door in two days. Do you feel like for those of us out there that may not know what we want to be, we can dress the part of what we think, where we think we want to go, and it's worth that price tag? Well, I, I think that playing dress up is all about kind of a, a therapy of sorts. Allie McGraw says it really well. She, we, we were shopping once in Santa Fe, and uh, it was the. Uh, ethnographic show in Santa Fe. So it's like you've got like ancient Asian textiles and and then you'd have like Western costumes, so many things. And Ali says to me like, what's your drag? I'm like, what does that mean? But I realized that it's like, what is, what do I want to put on today? Like, what, what is my costume going to be? So I think social media has been great to expose people to more things. And, and 
e-com has also made it easier for people to access those things. But but at the end of the day, we kind of have to be authentic to who we are. And and maybe it takes like kissing a lot of frogs, yeah, <laughs> buying a lot of stupid things <laughs> to get to that place. Okay, what's the, what's what's the frog for you? Oh, I have so many. I mean, my. God. We've got hours, so take your time. Uh, <laughs> I have a hit in three hours. <laughs> and I want to get some Chinese food. Um, I think that oh, there are so many crazy things I bought. I mean, a lot of things that I bought in the 80s, I t- unfortunately did not hold on to, and they were kind of great. Yeah. Um, I think that in the 2000s, I, I got very skinny in around like, 2010, 2012. And basically, I was like, you know, 6'3 and weighed 154 pounds, and every designer wanted to dress me. And I just wore like every crazy editorial piece. Looking back, I'd see some of these outfits and like, oh my God, that is like insane what I was wearing. Um, I, I don't regret any of those outfits. So, like, I mean, I may have kissed a lot of frogs in the outfits I wore, but the aftertaste was fine. I love that. <laughs> So obviously, in 2011, 2012, would you ever describe yourself as hangry? Oh, yeah. I was like, I was not eating. I was, I mean, I really became a victim of of fashion. I mean, I really like, I was like eating air because I had to be sample sized because I needed to be that guy who every designer wanted to dress. Yeah. Who, who would, and I thought I was saving money because everybody was sending me samples to wear. Well, it's okay. So you're <laughs> and I wasn't eating. It was great. I had so much money then. So you didn't go and buy like to a Whole Foods and buy like prepared carrots to snack on while you're in between the changing of the men's size too. I was just really so obsessed. I was basically eating um, organic, vegan, paleo, which means like there's nothing to eat. <laughs> the cupboards have gone barren. <laughs> and, and all I cared about was like I, I would drink a lot of um, water that was distilled water because I was told it was like really- more filling. Yes. And apples. <laughs> But so I was like, that- but I was like six three, and and you know I'm like a tall guy weighing 154 pounds, wearing like Philip Lim runway or McQueen runway or yeah. Givenchy runway because people were very enthusiastic, and I was getting photographed a lot. But then I started to get hungry, so, and my brain stopped working because I wasn't eating. My brain was really hungry. So now you're still six three. You're about 175 pounds. No, I'm more, gonna guess a little, a little more than that. When you go into the grocery store now, do you feel like you shop for? I mean, do you feel like you can you can see a box of cookies and you're like, oh, delicious? Or do you see something like an eight dollar jar of pickles and you're like, well, I've got to invest in this because this is probably the, the most healthy pickle I've ever seen. I love pickles and I love cookies. I um, go to Whole Foods like sometimes twice a day. Twice a day. Yes, that's so. I, I that's one of my favorite ways to shop. Really? So for food? Because I'm very like. Like, what's new? Like, I might go to Whole Foods after this, or I don't know if I'm going to eat at Split Rail, or if I'm going to go to But Nectar. you also miss, like, mentioned Chinese food. Yeah, I, I was thinking about having Chinese food after this, about going to Nectar, but, I, you know, I may not. I don't know. I'm, yeah. I'm like, it's, I, I'm very food obsessed. So do you feel like, because you've kind of calmed down on the investment pieces of, like, the Alexander McQueens of the world and, like, the designers, that, like, now your interest is, like, investing in the food and the experience? Well, I'm not – this is the crazy thing. Like, I'm not a foodie. Like, I will go to Whole Foods, but I buy, like, my coconut yogurt that I love. And that my, sounds a little foodie-ish and slightly bougie, but, it's like but really, go But on. it's, like, really simple. It's, like, I'm, like, I'm not a gourmet. Like, I do not appreciate – like I would never spend a lot of money on expensive food. I always really? say that I accept caviar on occasion, but someone else is usually paying. But but <laughs> but I'm not the type of person who like I can't spend I like, go to a really expensive dinner. I'm very very conservative in, in that regard to spending. I don't spend money on cars. I don't spend a lot of money on food. I want clean and healthy food. But yeah. I would never spend a fortune on food. And and now I'm like I can't spend the same money on clothes the way I used to. Yeah. The QVC ruined me. Yeah, well, or, you know, or made it, you better. Who it knows? It made me better. It really did. It made, me, it made me into a better consumer. Wait. So what would you say in the world of going out to eat 
has been your most adventurous, most expensive meal, was it worth it? Because one could argue, like, with all the money that you spent on fashion, it's interesting now that, like, you are more chic than ever. You're better looking than ever. Aww. That, like, why not go out and have a date night and celebrate and do something fancy around an experience? Well, every time I'm invited to, like, a really important restaurant, be it, like, French Laundry in Napa or, um, like, like a like beautiful, uh, highly praised James Beard yeah. uh, winning restaurant, I always have to tell my friends, like, just, I'm not a foodie. Don't waste it on me. There, there, I mean, it's like, I really have the most simple food taste. Give me like a nice grilled chicken, a Caesar salad, maybe a steak. I love French fries. I, I feel like you eat like a dude. I, yeah, I mean, well, but I eat a lot of salads, though. No, no. T- today, my trainer Conrad was like, um, "What you what you have for dinner the other day?" I was like, "A salad." He's like, "You eat." He's like, "You're such a girl." Because <laughs> <laughs> I was at Bergdorf Goodman yesterday having having lunch. He's like, "I like I had a salad." He's like, "Oh God," but but I do like 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 a steak and a Caesar and fries. Like I mean, yeah. I think one of the most delicious meals you can have is like. A steak with a baked potato and like a nice salad with some canned vegetables added to the salad. Like, canned vegetables, like, like canned green like peas. A, um, so not even a medley. <laughs> like like real greens, but like there's something about like like kid, like some canned beans, like not like like a lima or a green kidney, bean, a garbanzo, maybe some a black bean. Yeah, I take a lot. I don't know if I like a black bean on the salad. I can't okay. have too many beans. Sure, for obvious like, I don't reasons. Go, yeah, I don't want to over OD yeah. on the beans. It yeah, would be extremely unpleasant. <laughs> you know what I spend my money on? Especially in a tiny room like this. Yes, I spend my money on kombucha. I drink a lot of kombucha. Okay, like every day. so what is that exactly? So kombucha is a fermented mushroom that's a probiotic. Okay, I spent all my money on probiotics. That's so, the, let me cut to the chase. What do I shop? I shop. Oh, yeah, the last thing I bought were some probiotics last night. What Custom have probiotics. probiotics done for you lately? I don't know, but I just like I'm. You're like, into it. I'm very into digestion. I'm not into the food so much, but I'm into how it digests. So probiotics, how often are you taking them? Every morning, religiously. Every morning, before you oh, no, eat, no, every, after no, no, you no. eat? I, I take them at night. Do I take them in the morning? I okay. take them at night. I All right. So the kombucha is like supplemental to the probiotics? A little extra, a little extra pro for that biotic. Yeah. I'm like the probiotic man. Yes, you are, especially in that suit. Yes. I, I, my, my belly is really like probiotics are still giving me a belly. So you think you, like, have a svelte belly? No, I do. Well, it's apparently if you take a lot of probiotics, your belly will get svelter, but it's just not working yet. Do you want to bulk buy probiotics so that you're I, never I, without them? I always, you know, I, I live in three places, and I always have to make sure my favorite probiotics are in the refrigerator. So if you live in multiple locations, which you do. It sounds very glamorous, but it's East really coast, not. Your East Coast, your West Coast. Yes. So, like, I'm between New York and, and Westchester, PA, and then my house in L.A. So do you keep, like, three separate sets of clothes? Like, do you ever get to L.A. and you're like, oh, gosh, I have to go shopping for a T-shirt. I left well, them all on the East Coast. L.A. has, like, the bulk of my clothes. But I have sort of, like, my uniform is, like, a black T-shirt and a black pair of jeans like that's yeah sort of like my or, so i always so those are always in stock they're, they're they're everywhere and like you know my favorite underwear sure which I is like, what there's a spanish brand called es collection and and i probably am like the last person who should be wearing their underwear i think their underwear is really for like sexy guys <laughs> but uh, don't discredit but, yourself you're a solid 11 well thank you but they use modal in their underwear and i like the feeling of modal because i learned to love it because of the modal spandex essential tees we do for h by alston on qvc so is it a hundred percent like in an it's, underwear it's like a modal blend sure it, but I, completely I, breathable I have some on right now it feels real good amazing <laughs> all right See, this is the kind of thing so I that spent, I feel like we learn a lot about with somebody with just their shopping habits alone. Like, I'm going to leave today knowing that I got to get Aaron Graves some, like, yeah, Modal yeah, boxers. Yes, it's really nice. Like, it's, like, good Spanish. I, I will spend, like, coin on underwear. Can you read the label instructions, like, on how to care for it? Is it oh, in yeah. Spanish? Oh, well, yeah. Like um, English and Spanish, but I will always wash my uh, unmentionables in a gentle cycle with a natural detergent. Often in a lingerie bag. I love doing laundry. What? I love doing laundry. Why? I do it all the time. Like like yesterday I did laundry t- twice in New York. What kind of detergent do you use? I use like a, t- a, a Tide. You're a Tide man. Tide free pod. And I also use the Laundress 
the kind of the fancy. Yes. I do that for my sheets because I I, what? I I like the I like the scent and and I think it's you know better. I like good sheets. I spend money on sheets. So I want to go back to this. I. I I never thought I'd be talking about laundry deodorant, not laundry deodorant, laundry detergent. I also like good deodorant. We can talk about that. Yeah, Yeah, we can talk about that. Um, When it comes to laundry detergent, should you invest in something like a Woolite to do like all your jeans in to like prolong the wear? Because jeans are now, I mean, good ones start at three figures. Well, you should never wash your jeans. All right. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to wholeheartedly stop you there. I wear self tanner. I'm gonna always have to wa- like wash my so jeans. So my jeans, when I like, I'll get them dry cleaned periodically, and I kind of like. Rotate. So is that my only solution to dry clean them? Well, it depends. Like, I mean, if you're doing like a, a premium denim that's a little bit like you don't want to lose its its wash, like a like a true blue denim, like I have to dry clean them. Okay, fine. Like my black denim jeans, I haven't even. I don't think I've I've had them for like two years, and I haven't. Even, that sounds kind of disgusting. But they're like they're my fancy black jeans. Like I, then I have like my black jeans that aren't so fancy that I can throw on the machine. So jeans is an interesting question because, or excuse me, jeans is an interesting topic because people are spending more money than ever on mm-hmm. denim. It's, How do you know where to cap it and where should you say, you know what, bottom line, like this is the brand that's worth investing in? Bottom line, how does your bottom look in the jeans? That's all that matters. Words to live by. Have you ever watched a guy buy jeans? It's the most amazing thing. What's what's it like? Like just like looks at his like just like like a dude. Like if you're going with your husband and you're going jean shopping, doesn't he just like look at his butt for like four hours? It's the, I love watching. Like if I help like a friend's husband go jean shopping, it's just like the obsession with how their butt looks in the jeans. Like I mean, it, but it's the truth is like if your butt looks great in a pair of jeans, like a guy will spend like so much money for like premium booty. So with this idea of of premium booty, mm-hmm. what kind of cut should you go for to maximize your assets? Ha ha ha! If you are a man, if you are a woman, like, do you think like a slim fit on a guy is good? I, I, yeah, I think I think most men should avoid a, a jean that looks like a dad jean, unless you're like seventeen or eighteen and you're wearing it. Ironically, it's extremely aging. Sure, uh, it's like that dad jean. I, I like a slim jean. I don't want to do like a legging skinny jean. I think that's also like better for the kids. Sure. I mean, although I would wear one like a really like skinny jean, maybe like not in public. Are there any particular brands of denim that you love? I'm embarrassed to say, but I really like Gucci jeans, and they're obscenely expensive. What would you say is a close second <laughs> that we could find at the King of Prussia Mall? Um, I bought a really good pair of Rag & Bone jeans. I okay. think Rag & Bone does a great men's jean. And bought, worth the investment. Yes, I thought they were great. Well, this is, you know why I bought them? Why? I had to keep sizing down and sizing down. They have the greatest vanity sizing. So not only are you getting good booty in them, but like, yeah. oh, my waist is so small. <laughs> Do you want to go grab an Annie Ann's pretzel after this? Yes. I was like, just like I, I, this is not my waist size. Yeah. I, and I, you're getting I'm, the I'm cheese sauce. I'm not a 24-inch waist. Right. That's so impressive. Well, because they use a lot of spandex. You know, when we're on QVC and we're str- Stretching those garments, that's exactly what a rag and bone denim experience is like. I love it. So you're like, a, the guys are checking out their butts and then they're like, they're stretching out the waist. You're like, oh, I'm so skinny and fit. Love and life. And I, you know who else has nice jeans? Uh, Club Monaco. Okay. Yeah, I'll go to Club Monaco. All and, right, and, even for women? Yeah, I think they're good. Okay. I just bought a feathered skirt from Club Monaco. Uh, Club Monaco's great. Um, I want to touch on decades for a second because you own this amazing store that's all about vintage fashion. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you walk into decades and you see the likes of Chanel, Saint Laurent, these most amazing brands that so many of us, like, I mean, if you're coming from like a small town in Georgia, like myself, you would have never known where to find, how to shop for it. And so when you're shopping vintage goods, what do you look for? I I was doing an interview earlier today and with, uh, a Chattanooga paper. And um, I was talking to the journalist and explaining that when you're shopping for vintage, I think it's about finding those iconic pieces. Yeah. Condition is really important. And um, obviously, like a good value. The beauty of vintage or pre loved is that obviously it's environmentally very friendly. Yes. Because we're, we're, we are recycling. But the value is fantastic. If you're coming to decades and you're buying a Chanel jacket, you're maybe paying like. 
quarter or or a half of what the equivalent would cost today at retail. So yeah. it's it's a really fun way to shop and it it I think affords an opportunity for people to afford more luxury pieces in their wardrobe that are really prohibitive normally. How do you shop for decades? Because you have the California girl that's in there weekly looking at your new finds, but then you also have tourists that come by oh, yes. that may have completely different tastes and styles. I mean, so how a, do you stock it? We have a global clientele and we have to think about, um, I, I'm a big believer in the democratization of style. So, you know, I have great clients in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. I have clients in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And now I've got all the, these clients in, you know, Nashville and Chattanooga and yeah. Montgomery, Alabama. The truth is, at the end of the day, everybody just wants to look good. Yeah. Everybody wants to look sexy. I mean, and whatever our version of sexy is. When I say sexy, sure. it's like that kind of confidence and, 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 and attractive feeling that you get when you like, you know, you got it right, or you think you got it right. Yeah. Uh, so I think that in a global economy, we have to have the store have an inventory that's reflective of all those different demographics and also the different environments. Because in California, we don't have a severe winter, but we have customers coming to visit us who are living full time in colder climates. Yeah. So it, it's a... Um, I think the beauty of decades is that everything is just special. We don't do basic. We don't do boring. Yeah. There are enough places to get basic and boring. And where do you find all of these pieces to fill your store with? Because you travel so much all across the world. Do you just see something in another store and it catches your eye? Do you have clients that you know will say, hey, I don't want this Dolce & Gabbana jacket anymore. You take it. I think the nice thing about the, the 21 years that the store has been in business is that we really have incredible clients around the country and around the planet who love the fact that their clothes are going to go to the right home. Yeah. And that we do our due diligence to ensure that it's the pricing is correct. There, yeah. There's a lot of, you know, that one of the biggest fields in retail right now is the, the secondhand, the, yeah. the luxury, pre-loved luxury. There's so much investment in it. But... We still do it in a very rarefied manner with with um, not only to protect the consigner who's selling, but also like the with reverence to the designer. So yeah. we want to protect the longevity of the brand. And we also want to um, make the consigner not feel like, oh, God, that was such a stupid thing for me to buy. So in a sure. sense, like if there's resale value in what you've bought at retail, it makes makes one a little bit more enthusiastic to stick with that brand. So if you're someone making the investment for the first time, you know, and you've started to understand the importance of these investment pieces, whether it's a great handbag, a great pair of shoes, a leather jacket, how do you go about researching what that's worth so that you can make an educated decision when somebody, you know, if they go to decades, if they go to another secondhand store, like how do you know you're not paying too much, you're paying just the right amount? I mean, that's something that, you know, we do such due diligence at the store. So we yeah. we are researching. We're checking out auctions, other websites, um, platforms like um, blogs that will talk about, you know, I bought this bag for this much and I resold it for that much. I mean, just today I had a, a list of a couple bags in the store and the staff had done all of this research about comp pricing. So yeah. at a store like Decades, we, we've, we've done that for you. The nice thing about the internet, it's like, Google it. You yeah, know, it's just sure. Google. If something is too good, it's too good. And should you ever be afraid? Like, say I want to walk into a Chanel and I've saved up money for years to buy the classic flap bag. Even if you don't have that money in your bank account, should you ever feel embarrassed to go and look to see if, you know, when you go and look at that bag, is it really worth it? Does it make my heart go pitter patter? Like, how do you casually look in a place like that before you make a purchase? I think most luxury brands realize that it's about engaging with a customer early on and yeah. building that relationship. So maybe the first time you go to Chanel, you buy a lipstick. Yeah. And then maybe you, you buy a scarf or a pair of earrings. And eventually you, you one is able to buy the handbag. I mean, these things are so prohibit prohibitively expensive. So I think it is about that long-term relationship. The whole point of Instagram is not for Chanel to be selling $100,000 ball gowns. It's for them to be selling nail polish. Yeah. So I, I think that a lot of uh, these fashion shows also, I mean, it's like they're, they're less about uh, less about selling at the highest 
m- m- the most exclusive rarefied world. It's more about um, the entry level yeah. pieces. So I think that that's really refreshing to hear. Oh, I mean, I, and I, I, we've had customers come into the store and and it's like just wet grow with us. I yeah. Mean, listen, I've done it myself. There were things that I couldn't afford yeah. thirty years ago. And God, now I can't afford them again because I because I spent so much money for thirty years at Whole Foods. <laughs> exactly. I spent all my money at Whole Foods and Old on Jack. and on Spanish underwear. Ole. Yeah. <laughs> so with decades and being so close to this idea of Beverly Hills, let's say, wow, that's not in so redneck like Beverly Hills, y'all. Beverly Hills. Yeah. How oh, many my, got Beverly I, I describe my family as the Beverly Hillbillies. Perfect. Like we we are such normal, regular, crazy, eccentric people. I love I love that even more with Jack and Margo. That's yes. amazing. Have you ever had to had something so special you had to like activate the phone tree of California women? Like, look, ladies, this is like a one and done situation. Whoever gets here first, it's theirs. Oh, oh, certainly. We have like a a core uh, client like that. Sort of the people who are. Real, really, the family, and and who can get first dibs on those yeah. most exceptional pieces. What's been the most recent one? Yeah, I'm trying to think what just came into the store. I mean, it tends to be like an Hermes piece, so it'll be like yeah. a beautiful Hermes handbag. Um, and, and then, of course, there's always the the thing like if a woman is a size 14 in Chanel, like we, and she's a good customer, we want to let her know when when we received a lot of 14. So, yeah. but now that I'm on this crazy tour and going to all of these different cities, I'm I'm meeting so many more women who everyone has a thirst for style, and I and I truly believe, no matter who you are, you're into style. If you're the guy who just puts on a pair of Levi's and a white T-shirt every day, like that's your style. Yeah. So I, I think that whether you like it or not, and if you have the ability to dress yourself and choose what you have, like that's your style. So I think that um, I'm I'm enjoying crisscrossing around the country and just realizing, wow, everybody's really into clothes. Yeah. <laughs> More so than ever before, and younger people are so into clothes. That's really exciting. And then you, of course, have your clients that you shop for all around the world. Exactly. Like, you know, I like my clients who I help style or help them sort of curate really expensive museum quality clothing. And um, I am the voice of reason. In terms of how much they're spending? Yes. And also just like, I think people with extraordinary disposable income, sometimes in the moment one can get really caught up and just yeah like, but i'm like that voice of reason like you know you don't really need this and 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 that what's the most you've ever seen someone spend on an item of clothing um I th- don't be embarrassed i had a friend who got her wedding dress at chanel and i think it was like two hundred and fifty thousand euro amazing and yes I'm assuming she loved it. Yes. Does she, she was, still have it? Yes. She's, okay. still, she's still married, but I mean, I was like, wow. Oh, no. I didn't ask if she was still married. Yeah, I, I asked if she still had the she wedding still, dress. Yeah, she still Clearly, had, she still got it. Yes. She's shopping Chanel wedding gowns. Yes. And I, rem- and it, and I remember when I wasn't at the, the, the wedding. Uh, Wait, were you not invited after no, it, all No, it was a wedding okay. in, in the Gulf State region where, like, you know, men and women are separated. Oh. Gotcha. So, um, not, not not the Southern Gulf, Gulf the, the, the like Gulf, Panama like, City Beach, but yeah, Florida. This was in like you know the, the 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 Middle East. But I remember she sent me all of these photos after it. She was wearing this like really like decked out diamond watch. I was like, why are you wearing a watch on your wedding day? But someone had gifted it to her. It was amazing. It was it was. But she she was a beautiful bride. Can you tell us who your favorite client is to shop for right now? Um, you work with some pretty amazing people. I mean, uh, they're they're not necessarily they're not public figures. I mean, do you want do you want me to mention a public figure or just like an like anybody? Just um, tell us what you like about him and what they. I I have a lovely friend Chandra who joined me in uh, Lake Como in July for the Dolce and Gabbana Couture, and she's just so exquisite. Yeah. On the outside, but her inside, like she's just such a beautiful person, and everything she tried on was. She also used to be a model, and everything she tried on was so amazing on her. It was just like she just made the clothes come alive, and and but the 
clothes come alive because her inner beauty like just radiates. So it was so much fun. And so you know, and I love finding her things at the store that she appreciates because she's a, she's a collect she collects fashion like she does art. I end every podcast with one question. What is the one purchase you've never regretted? The one purchase I've never regretted. I mean, I don't think I've regretted any purchases. So the one I've, that I've never regretted. Yeah, like what's one maybe that like was your biggest investment? Like what's one that you will carry for a lifetime that you look at every day and you're like, that was a great decision. It's probably like a piece of jewelry, like a, a great watch. I have a beautiful one of a kind um, watch that was done for the, the French jeweler Boucheron's 125th anniversary. And it's the only one I was consulting for the brand at that time. I got it for a really, really good price, but it's the only one on the planet and I'll have it forever. I you never have a wear a watch it. where you were the only person on the planet that has that one. Yes. It's really, really special. Are you nervous to wear it? I never wear it. Did I wear it to the Emmys? I'm trying to think. I may have worn it to the Emmys, but but I think some of my jewelry pieces. There's some jewelry that I don't that I, like. I made mistakes on, but a couple pieces were like, I, I love them so much. Oh, Karen Silver, thank you so much. You're thank you so much. It was a pleasure. 